Hello everyone, and welcome back to our video lecture series looking at the pharmacology of NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. In our last video, we looked at and talked about three main effects clinically that these drugs have. The first being analgesia, the second being antipyresis, which is lowering uh, fever-like symptoms, and the third is anti-inflammation. And what this video is going to look at is, well, I've made these wild claims that these three effects happen in the body, but really, your question should be, well, how do they happen? And so that's what we're going to dive into now. The effects, these three main effects, really revolve around this molecule class known as prostaglandins. Before I, I discuss any specifics of this, I'd just like to explain the name. In the 1900s, there was a scientist who was studying seminal fluid. And this scientist isolated uh, an unknown compound, so we'll call it compound X, compound X. And in his uh, hypothesis, he thought that the compound was actually made in the prostate gland. And since he was working with uh, limited information in, in some sense, he named the, this compound prostaglandin for prostate gland. Later on, scientists sort of found out that actually this was, this was a misnomer and the molecule was from the seminal vesicle. And years later, scientists actually found out that, well, yes, there is uh, prostaglandins in the seminal vesicle, but they are also present in the GI uh, epithelium, in the endothelium of the blood vessels, in platelets. I'm running out of room here, but you get the idea that they're essentially everywhere, even bronchioles, uterine smooth muscle, etc. Unwillingly, this scientist stumbled upon an endogenous molecule class that's actually an important hormone that we're going to talk about now in more detail. When I think of hormones, I like to use an analogy to really understand how the hormones impact other areas of the body. Let's, let's, uh, let's try this analogy. I hope this works for you because it really helps me. If we take a pebble and we drop the pebble into a pool of water, we will see that the pool of water will have ripples. Now if we take a larger pebble that's actually more of a stone or rock, and we drop that into a pool of water, we're going to see much larger ripples. In fact, so large that I actually can't draw them on this page. In the same way, some hormones act in very local areas, whereas other hormones have much larger effects in the body. So my question is, what or how do prostaglandins work? And prostaglandins are both autocrine and paracrine in nature. I'm actually going to just erase this so I have a little bit more space. You can see that I, I've now drawn two, two sort of clusters of cells designated by these blue circles. And they're some distance away from one another. Now the cluster on the left is going to release and synthesize prostaglandins. That's kind of these orange spots that I'm drawing in now. So I'm going to draw your attention to one of these cells in particular that I've just colored yellow. So this yellow cell just produced this prostaglandin. This prostaglandin now can diffuse back to the same cell and exert an effect on the cell of origin. That is an autocrine mechanism of hormonal signaling. Auto meaning self. In contrast, the same prostaglandin that was produced by the cell could diffuse to an adjacent cell, perhaps this one or perhaps that one. That mechanism is called paracrine signaling, para meaning beside or sort of adjacent to. 
you can really remember paracrine as, or if you think about parallel lines, two lines that are beside one another. But can a prostaglandin that's made by this cluster of cells have an effect on these cells that are some distance away from them, perhaps on, uh, in a different part of the body? And the answer is, surprisingly, no. This is not typically seen. So why does that take place? Well, the reason is that prostaglandins are actually degraded quite rapidly. Now I find this signaling system absolutely fascinating. If we look at what, what's happening in nature here, if we want to limit a molecule to be autocrine or paracrine in nature, or in terms of its chemical message that it can send to other cells, what's the best way to do that? Well, if we make it highly susceptible to degradation, then if a prostaglandin is released, there is no chance that it can impact or influence a cell that's very far away because it's going to be degraded before it can reach that, that site of action. More scientifically put, prostaglandins have a very short half-life, designated by this T1 half. In fact, the order of magnitude is approximately 30 seconds for many of the prostaglandins. If we move on, what I've drawn here is the chemical structure of arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid. And I've drawn this structure not to, not to intimidate or to uh, kind of lead to the synthesis uh, pathway. That's actually what we're going to do in our next video. But what I wanted to do here is just give you an idea of what, what a prostaglandin even looks like. So it's this long carbon chain of, uh, that's actually exactly a fatty acid. And what I want to get across here is that, first of all, it's a 20 carbon molecule. This arachidonic acid. Remember, this is the precursor. This isn't actually a prostaglandin itself. But it's a 20 carbon molecule with four double bonds. And if we notice, it's actually an omega-6 fatty acid which means that we actually obtain this through our diet. Now, the final thing I'll point out on this, on this diagram here is that this carbon chain makes arachidonic acid and many of the derivatives, uh, most of the prostaglandins, highly lipophilic. What we have deduced so far is that we have autocrine signaling, autocrine function, and paracrine function, which means that there's a very short half-life for these prostaglandins. And these prostaglandins are lipophilic hormones. So they're lipid-based hormone molecules. My final discussion is going to center around something that I was a little bit obscure about initially, but some of the prostaglandin function. Now, I'm not going to go into the detail of all of the prostaglandin derivatives, but what I do want to say is with regard to the mechanism of action of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, Prostaglandins are upregulated in times of inflammation. So I'm going to do a video on this later on, but this is sort of going to be a brief introduction to this concept. But when we have a time of inflammation, we have an induction of prostaglandin release. This is done at the enzymatic level through upregulating the rate of transcription of certain enzymes. Again, we'll get into that in subsequent videos. But what I really need you to focus on here is that prostaglandins are sort of like your cytokines in the inflammatory storm. So when we have inflammation, inflammation takes place and then we get the release of cytokines. And once we have the release of cytokines, we get an upregulation of the amount of inflammation. When we have a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, we can block the release of prostaglandins and limit the amount of inflammation. As a result, they work as anti-inflammatory drugs. This video has been an introduction to prostaglandins, and we will definitely go into more detail in subsequent videos. Thank you very much, and have a great day.